So in a moment, we'll look at a few things. Uh, but before that, I want to start with an actual photo from work. Uh, we don't usually do photography at work, but I got special permission to show this uh, picture. Um, the guy in the middle is me. Uh, I dress up a little bit differently, more formal at work, as you can see. And uh, my coworkers and I are discussing a, kind of a, a common problem. And what we're discussing is something that has become slow in our system. And if this were not PyCon, uh, you know, you would hear somebody say, you know, something like this. Uh, maybe it's Python's fault, but since we're all Pythonistas, we know that usually it's not Python, it's the world. Actually, you know, it, usually it's not Python, it's, it's, uh, it's I.O. bound, right? And uh, since it's I.O. bound, we can solve it with this great uh, async programming. But uh, when we Google async, uh, a lot of times we find kind of this uh, example being used of uh, a non-blocking, you know, an async sleep, which is great. Uh, but a lot of times the example is something like this, right? And, and we don't often do this in our line of work. We do it maybe once, twice, you know, hello world. So uh, my name is Ronnie Shear and uh, software engineer at Bluevine. Uh, Bluevine is a fintech company. We love uh, Python. We're hiring. So if you'd like uh, to work with us, come and speak to me or one of my coworkers. And uh, recently, uh, thanks to our partnership with uh, Nationwide, uh, we've been featured in the back of a NASCAR racer. This is absolutely real. And the reason I'm telling you about this is because I went to high school in the States. And if you went to high school in the States, this is the, no. Actually, I'm telling you this because once you're featured on the back of a NASCAR racer, your app cannot run slow because it's ironic. And so I'm going to talk about, you know, kind of optimizing things in a production environment. And when I say production, I mean somewhere where you expect uh, reliability, security, and performance. But I think before we go somewhere that consequential, we should probably start with something really simple with little consequence, right? Let's start with time. And let's start with uh, this synchronous program. Um, many of you may have written something like this with your children before they kind of ran away and said, never talk to me about coding again. Um, and uh, kind of, you know, no surprises there. Like, what would print? Uh, second, not first. What would print here? Can anybody say? What would be the second thing to print out? You can kind of raise a shout out. Okay, thank you, great. And, and, and what would print maybe fourth and last? Okay, great. And how long would this take, you know, given... Shout out. Okay, so I hear about a consensus on about six seconds. It's great. Keep in mind, this is kind of a bad, not this laptop, it's my bad home laptop, so there's a little bit of overhead, uh, but no surprises, and uh, you know, this is a live recorded. I did not, this is not fake news, this is real. This is my terminal. Okay, so no surprises. Uh, hey two, hey four, and just a little over uh, six seconds, great. Now, let's look at that uh, await oh, sleep. And uh, if anybody knows this, let's, let's talk this through. So we have these functions that are async functions. And because they're async, we can await coroutines in them. Uh, you cannot do it outside an async uh, function. And, and basically, uh, the code reads uh, similar to the async code with a little different. Uh, at the end, you'll see the main function. It uses a really, really handy tool that I'm going to encourage you to use called uh, async IO gather. And what it does is it creates this extra awaitable object that gives you a list of the return values, OK? But things don't necessarily wait for one another. So, so like, let me ask you, what's going to print second? OK, great, great. Uh, now, what's, what's going to print uh, third? Okay, what's going to print last? And I like the money question, and, and how long will this take? Four seconds. And what is it dictated by, generally? Like the longest, great, great. So you guys know this, I don't know why you're here. No, I'm just kidding. Um, okay, so let's take a look at this, um, you know, uh, 
running. Great. Okay, so hey, two and two seconds later, it didn't wait, which is something that used to be a real pain to do in Python. I used to Google like sleeping uh, implementations and there were threads and you wanted to die and things like that. And at the end, you'll see something also handy. You'll see the two return values kind of handed to you by gather. So it's like, okay, before we go to production, we got to do something with, with like consequence, but consequence on myself and not the clients yet, right? Like personal finance. And like all normal people, I'm sure you guys know this, I have a, a CLI, a command line uh, interface that does my personal finance for me. Everybody does it nowadays. And it's completely useless because it's like, <laughs> what are you even doing? It's like screening your portfolio, your pension funds, and printing it nice and neat and smiling and... My wife thinks I'm weird. Okay, so, so you're going over this and you render the response to the console one by one, and it uses requests. How many of you have used requests in the past? How many of you like absolutely love requests? Like really amazing stuff, right? And if you told me to stop using requests tomorrow, I'd be really sad, right? So we, we can't even you know, fathom questioning using it, even if it means like spawning a salary worker, they'll spawn like five more, because request is awesome, right? And not surprisingly, it's not doing too much, but it's taking a bit of time. So we're making these kind of shady API calls, getting the prices of these mutual funds, and it takes about six seconds, right? And that's not very acceptable a lot of times, right? Because we want to deliver value quickly. But since we like request slip, we don't want to switch it up. But what if we kind of like shook these notions and did something? This is like kind of the naive approach. I'm sure there are people here who can see this and optimize it even further. But just kind of try to, as, as kind of without too much modification, like swap this. And here we're using AIO HTTP which is relatively stable, I think safe to say. People have been using it for a while. And they kind of encourage you to use this kind of fetch, put together this fetch function for yourself, which is similar to the way we make requests, right? But you get coroutines instead of like regular responses, right? So they don't necessarily block. And the first thing, this is really naive, you have the coroutines collected in this comprehension, and then I'm returning async IO gather, so at the end I'm returning this big awaitable that will give me all the responses, and I iterate them. It's like, maybe this will take less time, because all of a sudden I'm more dictated by the slowest one. Let's see how I do now. So that was that, right? It's like uh, 0.8 seconds, very little effort. And like, this is really useful stuff because even if you have workers that you outsource these tasks for not to block your request or your response, you don't necessarily want to burden your workers, right? And a lot of times you're doing this, you're collecting information for your client from multiple APIs. And now I'm gonna mention the first got you that I haven't encountered personally, but I've seen interesting warnings about. Uh, somebody wrote that they did something like this and they accidentally performed a denial of service on one of their partners. So, so doing async requests is very efficient. That's like sometimes you're not used to this efficient model and you're making multiple requests and you're actually burdening servers that are not ready for this. Uh, so I'd, I'd say kind of do dry runs, right? This is not what we do at work, by the way. It's what I do in my free time. Okay, next I want to talk about ASGI. Um, at ASGI, uh, there was a, I talked about it two years ago, a lot has changed. Uh, it started off as a protocol to kind of bring new, uh, pro, you know, uh, asynchronous uh, paradigms into Python web applications. So we had WSGI, which was this great protocol between Python servers and frameworks that allows us to develop more of an ecosystem. And now we have the asynchronous server gateway interface, which allows asynchronous servers to talk to asynchronous frameworks. And to kick it off, there was Django channels and Django 
and, and Daphne. And Daphne is an amazing server. I think it's phenomenal. It's very stable, and I have not encountered anything more production grade than that for web sockets. Uh, and Django Channels is incredible, and it's grown tremendously. But also, since we have ASGI, which just dictates the interaction, now we have a little bit of a great ecosystem showing up. So first of all, there's the elephant in the room, which is uh, Django Channels. Django Channels has changed tremendously, and it actually now supports async await. It didn't uh, when it started out. But it, it ships with incredible, useful tools for asynchronous code, which you'll see in a second. It's great for multiple services, and, and it does some great things for containing your code. So if you have a Django app, you should use uh, Django Channels. Uh, these are some consumers that you get, which do common things. Like this is a WebSocket consumer for async await, and there's also HTTP. The cool thing is, like, you can think of your consumer as a view. So this is like a method where you're set, sending like a chat message. But it doesn't like stop in this, in this send message, right? Because you can actually run these methods from other services in a very clean way. You know, like all you have to do is configure your service, you know, other service, not your process, like a command line or a celery task. And then you just get what's called the channel layer. And what it does under the hood is this method, you know, message bus, where your services are delivering these messages and your consumers handle your connections to your clients. And then you can, from another service like this, you can await your channel layer, but this is what happens. And can anybody kind of tell me why this happened to me? because you can only await from an asynchronous function. And it's very likely that your other services are not async. And so what do we do? Do we rewrite our entire code base? Uh, no. Actually, we have these great uh, uh, helpers. Uh, they do what I, what I like to call, uh, I think I made this up, wrap and call. And so I took this group send that the channel layer gives me, and I wrap it in an async to sync function from channels. And magic happens, and I can send my message from another service without having to get dragged into more async code when it doesn't need to be. And like, I think the greatest thing about this, and it's a great compliment, it's like people in my work were asking me, what are you lecturing about? I said, like, uh, async await in production. They said, we have async await in production? And that's huge, like the fact that you can actually contain asynchronous code by kind of wrapping these functions and by keeping the service separately. So that's Django channels. Uh, a quick thing, your tests also have to be async await, uh, and that can make for some crazy brain twisted stuff. Like if you don't await a coroutine, you get this coroutine object that you see on the bottom but it asserts as truthy. So there's a test that's passing, but it's not supposed to be passing, and you, you can spend days. So just remember, even these, you know, this uh, communicator is like your test client, and you have to await it. Your tests now have to be async await. And so this is from Andrew Godwin, creator of Channels, who was here last year, telling us that you know, async-capable Django is definitely coming, and that's great. But we don't all use Django, right? Uh, what about like tiny services that we're using, right? And like, what does this look like? The beginning of what kind of framework? Anybody? I heard it. Just say it loud, like, uh, or you can sing it. Flask. Okay, so, so this is uh, Quart, and it's very, very similar to to Flask. It doesn't just end there. Like, this is almost like a, a, a Flask route, but it's async. And you can do async stuff with it. And as a result, a lot of times, you can be even more performant because you have these non-blocking requests. You can handle more of them. And Quart also has bindings for some Flask uh, plugins and APIs. And people are using it, and they're enjoying it. Uh, I really like enjoying it for you know, my side spaghetti projects. And the cool thing is that if you can do this, 
you can also kind of do a while true for a persistent connection, right? This is a web socket that kind of shoots out the message, uh, hello, right? But what if you can hold reference to this web socket, right? Then I could iterate over connections and send them. And basically, that means that with this much code, and this is not trimmed down, you know, like, you can do a little functional chat room. This is the next WhatsApp. And if you're not using it, you're not a millennial. OK, so basically, if you're doing a little analytics engine and you don't want to do a whole like uh, Django app and you want to shoot things with web sockets from your clients, like something like this can kind of be modified to use. Uh, and, and it's great. And um, this actually works. Like, uh, let's, let's take a look. This is kind of me having a chat with myself, very profound. Like at this point, like the dog is even looking at me weirdly, like at home. And this is two browsers talking to one another through persistent connections. And I think that, like, it's very refreshing that you can do this with, this is a, like with, with concise, small amounts of code. Like, this is kind of the dream. So basically, this is a kind of to to get your appetite going to using these APIs in production. I think they're definitely ready, and I think the more we use them, the more useful they'll become. A few things I didn't talk about, there are other event loops uh, that you should check out, like uh, Jonathan talked to me yesterday about this event loop that, uh, that's called UV, UV loop that actually can boost your performance with, it's a drop-in replacement for the async IO event loop. There are other ones emerging, but I definitely encourage you to try these things out. And uh, thank you so much.